ACAP provides screenside chats as a member in public service, but it is neither a legal interpretation nor a statement of ACAP policy. Reference to any specific product or entity does not constitute an endorsement or recommendation by ACAP. The views expressed by guests are their own, and their participation in screenside chats does not imply an endorsement of them or any entity they represent. Views and opinions expressed by guests are their own and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACAP or any of its officials. Good morning. I'm Dr. Gay Carlson, president of the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, with number 20 of my screenside chats for ACAP members. Screenside chats are meant to share timely clinical practice and other information from experts on key topics during the COVID-19 pandemic that's continuing to plague us. Reminiscent of President Roosevelt's fireside chats during the Great Depression and World War II, I'm hoping they'll be informative, and comfortable, and fill a niche not otherwise addressed by materials available. I'm pleased to be joined today by my longtime friend and colleague, Dr. Harold Koplowitz, formerly Director of Child Psychiatry at Long Island Jewish Medical Center and NYU Child Study Center. Harold struck out on his own 10 years ago to found and develop the Child Mind Institute. Child Mind Institute is an independent national nonprofit, which brings together Harold's passion for evidence-based cutting edge clinical care, development of young clinicians and research into the healthy brain. Besides seeing lots of patients, he has boots on the ground experience having raised three sons with his artist wife and teacher, Linda, and he's the go-to person for many TV programs and news outlets. So Harold, on Screenside Chats, we've been discussing ways that we can help parents navigate their many child rearing tasks made especially difficult by COVID-19. In fact, as you know, this was a special uh, venture or feature in the February 7th New York Times. I was gonna give you a call since I know you've given this a lot of thought over the years and lo and behold, you've published a book on your parenting model called The Scaffold Effect the proceeds of which go to Child Mind Institute. So it's no news that lots of parents are really concerned about how the past year will affect their children. What choices are they going to make that are going to damage their child for life or not so much that? How can we help them with this struggle? What what do you suggest um, to give them some reassurance and hope during these times? So, you know, Gay, we've talked about for years how parents come to us and are so worried that they're not doing enough or that they're doing too much, and they're so quick to blame themselves. And the one common thread that I've seen for for me and my colleagues over the last 10 years, seeing thousands of kids, is the fact that parents want to know how they can make it better and not worse when their child has a mental health disorder. And the same themes and the same guidelines that are important for parents with a child with a mental health disorder work for parents, particularly now during COVID, in making resilient, self-reliant, and secure kids. And that's how basically the scaffold effect came into effect. The idea that parents can provide support, can provide structure and encouragement, even with the greatest stressors around. Now, this book was written a year and a half ago, and then it was re-edited, and then it was published. But with COVID, not it couldn't unimaginable the dystopia that COVID has brought upon us. But um, but it's more needed now than ever before because we know that every child's mental health, in some way or another, is being affected by the stressor of social distancing, of distance learning, of financial stress in their families' homes, and of the fear that something terrible is going to happen to one of their relatives as far as their health goes. You know, when this started, I have to say, Harold, I was hoping that somehow or another this crisis would bring us together. And, you know, I was thinking about it like World War II, um, we're going to sort of fight the enemy and we would fight the enemy here. That clearly hasn't happened. And I think part of the reason that it hasn't happened is because of the fact that we can't go to each other. We are forced to socially distance. We are attacked on all sides. I, don't you feel overwhelmed by that sometimes? Right. So It's so interesting that um, 
the challenges of COVID are tremendous. So on March 15th, we closed the physical um, sites of Trauma Institute in California and New York. And 48 hours later, we became a telehealth uh, service. And it took a while. Uh, I have to be very honest, it was very challenging in the respect that 98% of our existing patients stayed with us, but very few new patients started to come in. And because of the model we use at the Child Mind Institute of this evidence-based psychosocial interventions, the average patient stays 16 sessions. If they have an anxiety disorder, if they have a mood disorder, it's around 24. So we are used to seeing 30 to 40 new patients per week. And all of a sudden we went to four patients a week. And so that we started to think, you know, 50% of our clinical revenue had disappeared. Our clinical research had to be put on hold. Um, it was a very scary, challenging time. And what's interesting is that there's opportunities also. And I think the two of us know each other well enough that I, I, I sometimes am dangerously optimistic. And so, you know, we started the Child Mind Institute in 2009 in the middle of an economic tsunami. And what we found is that the desperate need for parents to get evidence-based information during COVID on how to parent their children. And we developed 156, 157 Facebook Lives uh, on our Facebook page that got anywhere from around 20,000 views to 252,000 views on 20 minute Facebook Lives. And it shows, by the way, for a while we were doing it twice a day, once in Spanish, once in English, and now we're only doing it once a week. So I think you know, parents needed a lot of information in the beginning and they calmed down. But to answer your question about being overwhelmed, I think I'm also energized. I never was a fan of telehealth. I thought it, you couldn't do the same quality of work on a screen as you could do in person. I most probably am wrong. We're watching very carefully our outcomes and we have metrics. Um, the second thing I didn't think would be at all possible um, was telecommuting. And in California, where our offices are in San Mateo, it can take hours to get to work, to get over the bridge from um, the East Bay to San Mateo. Um, all of a sudden, public transportation in New York City is challenging because people are afraid. And yet, people are doing great work um, from their homes. Do you know, they, they are sitting in front of a screen and getting work done. Um, and I think, I think that the one silver, there's two silver linings, and I have trouble with the word silver lining, is telemental health. I don't think it'll go away. I think it'll be a supplement to many of the traditional therapies that we do. But secondly, I think that mental health has had its moment. I think that the fact that there are millions of people who now have some compassion to understand what it's like to feel that you're hopeless in the morning, that you've lost your appetite, that you feel like you're you know, running a marathon, but it's very muddy and it's up to your ankles. And the fact that someone like Michelle Obama says, I have a low grade depression, and that my hope would be that after COVID, people would have compassion and understanding for the children, the, 20, you know, the 17 million kids who without COVID still have a mental health disorder, or still feel distress and dysfunction, still need evidence-based care, need better insurance coverage. My hope is that we don't forget, you know? Um, I, I think that is important. important. But <clears throat> I think that's important. Once the pain goes away, will people forget the pain and, and, and learn from the experience? But I agree, I agree with you. I think, I think there is a, a, a certain element of what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Let me ask you, did you get the idea of the scaffold effect from, I, I know you and I have worked closely with schools for years, and it's an educational con concept, scaffolding the child to, to kind of um, enhance their learning and mastery. Is, is that where you got the idea from, so or is it because of all the building and, and no, renovating? No, the, 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 what really happened <clears throat> was that I had been examining the way people parent, and I, I, I sometimes find it very challenging to no matter how rich, no, no matter how poor, how parents are almost in their DNA, they want to protect their kids. They really desperately don't want their kids to be in pain. And inevitably they start doing things for their kids that are dangerous. You know, they push their kids to graduate you know, to the next grade, even though their reading isn't any good, or they're writing their kids' papers, or they're covering for their kids uh, with whether it's white lies or outright lies to the school. And that that kind of either helicopter or concierge or enabling parenting is exactly the opposite of what you want to do 
if you want your kids to to be strong, to be secure, to to feel that failure is an option. Success is an option, failure is an option, but it's the effort that you want the parents to um, truly uh, reinforce and and celebrate. You know, um, years and years ago, uh, I can't believe how many years, it's over 30 years ago, I was in um, the city and I was having dinner with a summer bachelor. The wives had left the city and this guy was chatting with me and in passing, he said, do you know so-and-so? This is 31 years ago. Do you know uh, so-and-so? Uh, he can barely put two sentences together. He makes a million dollars a year. And you know so-and-so, he makes $2 million a year. And I was sitting there thinking, I'm the chief of child and adolescent psychiatry at Long Island Jewish. I got, I'm one of the youngest chiefs of child psychiatry. Um, and I thought I'm successful. And I wonder if this guy knows how little money I make. And then I started thinking, does everybody I know make up more than a million dollars? Am I the only person? Did I miss the day at school where they taught you how to make a million dollars? Did they rip out the pages? But I thought I'm not going to let him know that I don't make a million dollars. And inevitably I twitched or something. And the guy had the nerve to say to me, after all, Harold, you're just a physician. I thought, do you have any idea how hard it was to get into medical school? <clears throat> just a physician. So I... I felt incredibly numb and thought, you know, I can't believe how I got into this state that I'm a failure and that everyone around me um, makes so much money and so successful. And I was walking, I said goodbye to him, and I'm walking down Madison Avenue between 91st and 90th Street, and it's a beautiful summer night, and walking up the block, hugging each other with uh, their arms around each other, is Paul Newman and Joanna and Joanne Woodward, two of the most famous movie stars at that time, right? Uh, Joanne Woodward, I think, is still alive, and Paul Newman has passed away. He has bluer eyes than you would think. He's shorter than you would think. He, she's still got blonde hair. They clearly like each other. His arm is wrapped around her wrist. He's got a his jacket, a seersucker jacket, which makes his blue eyes bluer. And I'm just too cool to say hello. And they walk closer to me and they say, hi, how are you? I said, fine, how are you? I've never met them before. And they say, it's so good to see you. I said, it's delightful to see you too. Aren't we lucky? Such a beautiful night to be living in New York City. I said, yes, we're so lucky. And um, to live in the city. And he says to me, well, I hope I'll see you soon. And I said, yes. And I keep walking. And instead of being super excited, gay, that two of the most famous movie stars in the world think they know me, all I could think about was that each one of them was making more than a million dollars. <laughs> and, and I was afraid started, you were going to say they were going to ask you, and how much do you make? <laughs> no, no, but the, the issue at hand was I thought if I'm a child living in this bubble, and this bubble could be Manhattan, this bubble could be the suburbs of Chicago, it could be, um, it could be Austin, Houston, it could be uh, L.A., um, and you're surrounded by successful people, that whether they're successful in business or successful in writing or successful in acting, you can diminish a child. You can forget that some child who's struggling with algebra and works with a tutor and works super hard and manages to get a C plus, that C plus has to be rewarded. And that was 31 years ago. And I kept finding myself and then having three sons, how difficult it is not to reward the A or that you won the race instead of the effort that sometimes is extra, extra hard for certain kids. And so this has been brewing in my head for a long time. I think you also know that I don't love to write books. I wrote one book in 1996, it's nobody's fault. I wrote the next book in 2002, More Than Moody, and it's been almost 20 years. And so the, uh, the agent is starving. You lay down liter until the urge passed. <laughs> my, literary, my literary agent is starving. <laughs> And so if he's living on my 10%, but it really seemed to be correct in the decade that I've been at the Chalman Institute, that that theme kept coming up again and again with my colleagues. And I was also very fortunate that we have an incredible team of almost 50 clinicians who participated in this book by telling their stories. And also the interesting part is telling stories about their own parenting. Because the one thing I found about most parenting books is that you see the parenting expert standing up and shaking his finger. And this one basically has a lot of vignettes that say, please don't do this at home. <laughs> you know, don't follow my lead. And here's what, here's what went wrong with the way I did this. You can do better. It seemed to me that you're the, um, if I were to put it in, in mundane terms, the message from the scaffold effect is 
you need to give kids enough rope so they can explore, but not so much that they hang themselves. Correct. Correct. And I think most parents, you know, well, I think there's two things. One, keep remembering that airplane where the flight attendant says, put the mask That's on yourself done. before yeah. you put it on your kids, which always seems wrong, right? But is right. It's correct. Mm -hmm because self-care really is childcare. And during COVID, it's particularly easy to stop doing self-care. You know, we're overwhelmed. It's not easy to exercise or to eat healthy food and to sleep and to maintain a schedule. But secondly, it's the fact that when they're four, it's the easiest thing to say, come on, let's get dressed in the morning for preschool and to take off their clothes and put on their clothes for them instead of being patient and letting them get the independence of putting on the shirt and putting on their pants and maybe helping them with their socks. And it's, you know, the efficiency and the messaging of, you can do this, I'm gonna sit back, it's gonna take a few more minutes than I would usually get, but I see the value of building an independent child. It's particularly difficult, I think, when they're a teenager, when naturally they want to separate from us, and we at the same time have to have guidelines and discussions about the big talks about sex and drugs, <clears throat> but at the end of the day, recognizing that the building is going up and the scaffolding is the parents who can be there to provide that structure and that support, but at the end of the day, the building's blueprint really comes from the child. I mean, I tell the story that uh, my oldest son uh, was great at science. And to be very honest, my plan for him was he should be a doctor. He's great at science. He's a really good student. And sometime in high school or in college, he turned to me and said, I know you want me to be a doctor. I hate blood. I'm uncomfortable. I'm just not going to become. And if I become a psychiatrist, I'll always be the wrong Dr. Kopluitz because I don't even like children. And it was clear he wasn't going to become a doctor. And somewhere in high school, college, he literally decided he was going to be a DJ, okay? Uh, and the scaffold had to change. I was building a skyscraper and he was basically telling me this is going to be a multi-level split level. And we and my wife and I figured we'll, we'll just move the scaffolding around. And by the way, there were all of three white Jewish DJs at the time. Mark Ronson, who's now won the Academy Award with Lady Gaga, uh, DJ Cassidy, who was actually part of the inauguration concert, and DJ Josh Kay. And okay, that's what- So when they're good, they're very, very good. Right? And so I thought, okay, you know, he's going to LA afterwards. He's going to tr struggle. And during the summer between his junior and senior year, he took an internship at a bank at Goldman Sachs. And somehow, he drank the Kool-Aid and tried to convince us that the creativity of being a DJ really worked in private equity. And all of a sudden we were redoing the scaffolding. I felt like saying, wait, what? I thought we're doing DJ and the building started to change. And it seems simplistic, but frankly, you have to rearrange your goals and you have to still provide that encouragement just because he's not doing A, what you thought he should do, but B, he's changed his mind. You, you're already doing something else and he's now saying, I've changed the plan. And I think that goes for all of us, even when our children have real limitations. You know, one of my kids has really terrible dyslexia and we've done everything possible when he was a little kid. And he's still, you know, reading is still a challenge and writing is still a challenge. I mean, he's a college graduate. He got a, uh, he got a graduate degree also, but listening to him read out loud really takes uh, a lot of patience. You have to keep smiling because he's mispronouncing the words and he's skipping words. And frankly, the scaffolding is different. You know, whether in that case, it was Linda Mood Bell, which turned out to be a program that we had to, Linda actually had to move to um, Boston for a, a half a summer so that he get this intensive work. Um, and we were always watching that he had the right tutors, that he was in the right school. Uh, that was a different kind of scaffolding than we had to give our other two sons. You know, I, I, I think the model that you have is, is certainly a, a very compelling one, Harold. But one of the things, again, we're professionals. One of the things that I think is complicates life is I do think that the building is different when you've got a kid with um, neurodevelopmental disorders or serious psychiatric illness and when you've got a serious psychiatric illness. And so you've got an issue where if, if you're able to function, you're wending your way between accommodating 
You really can't expect a kid in a wheelchair to go up a flight of stairs. You really do have to give the kid a ramp. So you're uh, wending your way between accommodating and enabling. And it seems to me that the real gift of parenting, I don't know, it's gift or luck or, you know, you, you do screw up, let's face it, you screw up, but fortunately you don't, um, you don't just get one chance. I mean, you get multiple chances at this thing. Um, but really, I, I know with my kids, and you and I have talked about our, our, our kids, um, you know, there's, you don't know what a, how to draw that line between accommodating and enabling. And I don't know if there's, is that really something you can always figure out yourself? I mean, is that one of the things that we do as clinicians or as therapists is we give another pair of eyes or to the circumstance and then we do that scaffolding with our patients where we say, yeah, you're, you know, you're doing a good job there. Or, I'm not sure that's what you should have said there. I mean, it, it's kind of a similar set of circumstances. Yeah, I, I think we're the scaffold for <clears throat> these families. I mean, yeah. really, uh, being a child psychiatrist, we work with families, right? And mm -hmm. so we have to be very um, aware and respectful of how challenging the road is and the journey is for these families and the parents in particular in, you know, what the expectation was. I think when a baby is born, I think there's an expectation for Instagram moments for producing a neurosurgeon, an artist, a president. And then when the child has limitations, some very real limitations and has got distress and dysfunction, we have to recalibrate our expectations um, and still hold on to our child's self-esteem. We have to keep building their self-esteem and that if we do too much for them or we do too little, their self-esteem will be damaged. There's no doubt about it. Self-esteem is built by what happens in the real world, how much success they have. Um, I wanna go back to one thing you said. I think parenting is one of the major events in our lives that we have redos. And I tell, that's the message from the scaffold effect. No matter how much you mess up, you can always redo. You can always go back and say, I, I made a mistake that those set of consequences are too severe. We're gonna change that. Or <clears throat> I think, you know, I have to apologize. What a great model. I have to say sorry because I didn't, I didn't show up on time and I planned on showing up on time. So, you know, taking a redo and saying repeat is perfectly okay. You can't do that in the World Series or in the Super Bowl, but you certainly can do that as a parent and you can grow as a parent you can be better and better and the first thing you have to do is you have to secure your foundation you have to secure yourself you have to scaffold yourself uh, and for certain families and certain parents that's going to be more challenging the more anxious ones the depressed ones the ones who struggle with interpersonal uh, skills we're going to have to help them because we, unless they're our partner, it makes it very difficult. I, I think, by the way, I don't know if you remember, there was a um, child psychiatrist by the name of Ev Doolin. And Ev was an adolescent um, psychiatrist at Cornell. And when I was a trainee in general psychiatry, he gave a class where he said, uh, here's the good news about being a child and adolescent psychiatrist. Your patients grow up and you grow old. And I thought, oh, you know, I was what, 27, 28, what a stupid thing to say. And now <laughs> you know, I'm now in my sixties yeah. and I have to tell you that um, I've had the pleasure uh, and the privilege of having patients come back to me 25 years later. And I think the reason for this is that I have been doing television for a very long time, but not a lot of TV, you know, a few minutes, three minutes, four minutes, let's say five times a year. And I think what happens is that the parents see me and they say to their kid, oh, look, it's your child's psychiatrist, Dr. Kopfluitz. And so I had a patient uh, 10 or 11 years ago call me up and left a message saying that he wants to speak to me. And the secretary at NYU said, uh, you can't find the chart. And I said, well, you can't find the chart because I saw him 25 years ago when he was seven years old. And they said, you remember? I said, of course, I got him on, I got on the phone. I mean, he was, he, he was a very uh, hyperactive kid. He was a very prestigious uh, day school here in New York. And once we treated him, which, mind you, this is 35 years ago, I put him on Ritalin, which was a little controversial. Uh, he was significantly better, but then it became clear that he couldn't read, that he had dyslexia also. And the school's tolerance for that 
was very low. And so he left the school and it was at that time that I moved to Long Island Jewish. And so I didn't get to, he, he didn't follow me to, um, to the next place. And so when I'm talking to him on the phone, I said, so Mitchell, tell me what's going on. He said, I'm, you know, I graduated college. I went to the University of Arizona, a terrific salt program. I did this, I did that. Uh, but this economic tsunami was 2009. I, um, my business just failed. Uh, my marriage is in trouble. I need to see, I need to see a psychiatrist. I said, fine, tell me where you live and I'll get you the name of a good psychiatrist. He said, I live in New York and I want to see you. I said, well, I'm a child psychiatrist. And he said, but you're my child psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. And to have the privilege of a 32 year old walk into your office and he's, he was a very beautiful child. He was now a handsome man. And he says to me, Dr. Goff Lewis, you haven't changed at all. And I said, well, if that's true, you need an ophthalmologist, not a child psychiatrist, because I have gray hair and I'm 25 pounds heavier than when I was, you know, in my 30s. So he sat down, he tells me the story. And I have trouble, by the way, figuring out whether or not he has real depression or he's just demoralized because he's in the middle of a terrible uh, event of his life. Everything seems to be falling apart. And at the end of the hour, by the way, um, I don't have an answer. And I say to him, you know, um, this is pro bono because he tells me he's got no money. Right. And first of all, it's just a joy to see him. And he's standing there. And I said, don't worry, come back tomorrow. We'll figure this out. And while he's standing there, by the way, he looks so sad that I did something that I don't touch kids anymore, right? I'm afraid of touch. I hugged him. He hugged me back. He got a little weepy. He came back the next day and he said, you know, Dr. Kavlis, I just have to tell you, I knew that I should come to you because you went and visited my school when I was seven years old. And afterwards you told me I had a mean teacher. <laughs> the meanest teacher. She was picking on him even when he didn't do anything wrong. You know, typically you jump on that ADHD kid. And so, <clears throat> he said, and we figured out in the next hour, he'd lost his sex drive, his appetite. He had a full-blown depression. He really responded well to an SSRI. The, the best part of the story is that he's better, right? And do you know that he actually shows up at the Child Mind Institute? I was at NYU, then I now had moved. And he shows up at the gala every year. And he tells people that he's sitting at a dinner. I, Dr. Kofflewitz is my psychiatrist when I was seven. And he'll always be my psychiatrist when I need him. And I think that as child psychiatrists, that's really remarkable. You don't feel that way about your dentist or your pediatrician. We get to know kids in a really remarkable way. And even we teach them how to scaffold. He knew that he needed help. He knew that he had to call someone. And that I think is really the essence of our work that we, we're not going to fix kids. We're not going to, you know, we don't do neurosurgery, but what we do do is give them the opportunity to become attentive enough, less anxious, more focused. And whether it's as a team with other clinicians, we let them start a different trajectory of their lives um, at, without hovering, without helicoptering, without being a snowplow, but we're helping parents and the families and these kids to, to be stronger, to really turn into the building that they're supposed to turn into. So I think that's a, that's a good uh, metaphor to end with, that, that um, we, we provide, if we do our jobs well, we, we provide scaffolding to our families and we help our families provide scaffolding to their kids that they, um, I, I think that there is some complexity to the kind of building that's being scaffolded. It's, some buildings, you know, are, are, I don't know whether they're easier to build than others, but I imagine they are easier to build than others. Um, and the, but that we have to move along with it in order to provide what's necessary. So I, I think there's one, there's one other piece, and that is our colleagues. So, I have literally known you since uh, the day I walked in in my adult psychiatry boards and you were one of the examiners. Oh, and I knew you'd bring that up. <laughs> no, 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 I'll tell you why it's important. First of all, even while you were examining me and afterwards, and I was clearly uh, you know, anxious about the test, and then by chance you were an examiner during my child boards also, you were, you, you were teaching. The examination was actually a lesson. Um, I did well, I passed. But over the years, over the decades, um, the fact that you were a few steps ahead of me on your career 
um, your advice, your without telling me what to do, but giving me your opinion about whether I should do this or that uh, has been very valuable. And I have to tell you that I've done that with my trainees, <coughs> excuse me, and my colleagues as well. And I think that in child psychiatry, it's, we're such a small field and there's such a high demand um, that the competition doesn't have to be very great. The collegiality and the ability to scaffold each other um, is very important. And so th it's a moment for me to publicly say thank you to you for well, thank not, you. Every th not only for what you do for me, but I think for what you do for the field. I, I appreciate that, Harold. Um, and I think it's, it's nice when we are able to applaud each other's accomplishments. I certainly, I'm certainly been proud of you for all these years. And I have to say, your, your comment reminds me of when I talk to trainees about looking for a job, I say, look for a supervisor who will give you a hand up the ladder, not one that'll stomp on it as you're trying right. to climb up. <laughs> What's okay. the lift you up, right? <laughs> That's right. All right. Well, I thank you very much for being with us today, Harold. Um, you certainly are a bright spot in child and adolescent psychiatry. Thank you. And uh, the Child Mind Institute has been a really uh, wonderful venture for you and for, the, um, for your staff and for your kids that you see. Thank so you. thank you. And um, thank you to our audience who've been viewing us. And um, stay tuned for our next Screenside Chats. Thank you all very much for tuning in. This is Gay Carlson for ACAP's Screenside Chats.